Hello everybody, I'm Nick and in this video I'm going to introduce you to a new way of doing resilience in .NET that was introduced in .NET 8 and everything you're going to see here sort of existed before with the addition of the poly NuGet package which I've talked about years ago on this channel but finally in .NET 8 Microsoft standardized everything by wrapping poly in their own APIs and making it very easy and convenient for everyone to add resilience in their APIs and their applications. Now, what do I mean by resilience? Well, I mean that if there's a failed condition in your application, you want to handle that gracefully using some advanced patterns. Yes, the most common one is probably handling an exception and then potentially just saying bad request. But what if you want to retry that? What if you want to have a circuit breaker? What if you want to have a fallback? All those things need extra code, but what I'm going to show you in this video doesn't require any of it, or at least it simplifies it significantly. And you're going to see more and more of it used in .NET 9 and moving forward, because in a way that type of resilience is part of the cloud native concept that Microsoft is really pushing for .NET. Now let me show you what I have here. I have an API over here. It is a weather API, but it's not just the built-in in-memory weather service API. What I'm actually using here is I'm calling the Open Weather Map API, which is an open API. You can grab a free key and you can have some requests per minute you can make to that API to get the current weather per location, per city, and so on. And if I just quickly run it, I want to show you how this works conceptually. So API is running and we're going to go to Insomnia and I'm going to say that, hey, I want to get the current weather for London. I'm going to go ahead and get it. And as you can see, what a surprise, there's clouds. Actually, it's pretty sunny right now, but the API currently says clouds. If we have something like Paris, then that is clear. Of course, it's Paris. And then at Warsaw, what about that? Well, that's cloudy. So this is actually the current weather forecast. However, I do have a dependency on a third party API. I have the Open Weather Map API, and that API can rate limit me, which means the application can start failing the requests until I have my rate replenished, or it might be down for some seconds, or it might take too long to respond. And that affects the behavior of my own API. And by the way, I am using an API over here, but this is not an API specific thing. If you're using a class library, if you're using a console application, even if you're using a Blazor application, you can apply everything you're going to see in this video. And in fact, an application like Blazor can really use resilience like this because you might want to fail faster to provide a better experience, or you might want to retry. And that's exactly why we just released our very first course on Blazor on Dome Train called Getting Started with Blazor. And it's a course by Jimmy Engstrom, who is a Microsoft MVP for Blazor. He is an international public speaker. He has been using Blazor for years and he has a book on it as well. So he's one of the best people to teach you Blazor. Many things have changed in .NET 8 compared to the previous versions of Blazor. So if you want to get started or if you want to refresh your memory, use the link in the description and use code GSBLAZOR20 at checkout. The first 400 of you can get 20% off. So what I want to do here is this call that calls that API, I want to reinforce it with some resilience. I want to say, for example, that if something goes wrong with this call, if there's an exception, for example, well, I want to retry that API maybe a couple of times and I want to retry it with some special conditions because you don't want to just retry on a fixed length. You want to have something called a jitter. Now, all that sounds complicated, but it is made extremely easy for us now. And by the way, there was a time where I had to do all this by hand. You don't have to anymore. All I'm going to do is I'm going to go to NuGet and add the Microsoft.extensions.http.resilience. There is also the normal dot microsoft dot extensions dot resilience that has all of the abstractions but the http will add some special http related things for us so i'm going to add that instead so just add this new package and let's say i want to add a, a retry policy for this api request so if something goes wrong if there's an exception retry it a couple of times how do i do that well you might say just go ahead write a try catch and then add a loop yeah, okay, that will work for some basic stuff, but it gets very, very complicated the moment you introduce more advanced patterns like a jitter. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that I'm going to have a pipeline or a resilience pipeline, and I'm going to say new resilience pipeline builder over here. So we have a builder pattern. And the first thing I want to say is add retry. So we want to add a retry policy and we're going to configure the options of the retry strategy. So the first thing I want to have is when should I handle that with a retry? Well, I'm going to use the should handle property and I'm going to say new predicate builder and I'm going to say handle 
and what do I want to handle? Well, I can use this normal version that just grabs the exception that is thrown as a handle condition, and I can say if exception is, I don't know, type of, and so on, but we actually don't need to complicate it. All we can do here, very, very simply, if I want to have a generic scenario, is I can say I want to handle an exception. Now, if you have more specific situations, like for example, um, I don't know, maybe a cancellation exception, or I think it's called a timeout exception, and so on, you can narrow down the type of exception you want to handle, and even then you have access to the object, and you can say that I want to handle this exception only if the time it took to time out is more than whatever. Now, to simplify this, I'm just going to say that I want to have the exception here, and that's it. So I should handle whenever there's any exception. Generally, you shouldn't do that because you don't want to retry things that even if you retry, they won't succeed again. Like, for example, the rate limiting condition, you want to wait for them to replenish the tokens first. But I just want to show you how we can build this uh, strategy. Uh, then we can have a delay. So how long we should wait between retries, basically. So I'm going to say time span from seconds. And let's just wait four seconds. Why not? In fact, four seconds might be a bit too much. Let's say two seconds. And then I'm going to say that the max retry attempts will be two. So one when I make the call and then two more. In total, I'm going to try three times. So these two is on top of the additional original one. Then I'm going to specify the back off type. So back off is when you make the action and the action fails, how do you want to deal with that delay between the first call and the retry? Well, there's three back off types supported. There's the constant, which means Every time I'm going to wait for two seconds, there's the linear and then you have exponential, which means that by a power of two, we exponentially wait more and more and more to give more time to the application to potentially recover. So you go from two seconds, then two in the power of two is four and so on. Exponential backoff is generally a good practice, but it should be coupled with something called a jitter. Now, what is a jitter? Well, a jitter, and I'm going to introduce it by just saying use jitter true, is the ability to add a bit of a randomization in the delay front or back. This means that if I have five applications that all get throttled at the same time, or if I have a multi-threaded scenario, the retries won't just spam the application the moment that we release from the back of. And this will spread the requests a bit more, allowing us to handle this scenario better. Especially when exponential back off, using a jitter is very, very important. And then you can have other things like you can customize the delay so you can have a delay generator. You can say that the max delay I want to stay here for between retries is this amount and so on. We're not going to set any of that. Now, the good thing about this resilience pipeline builder is that you can actually chain more types of policies. So I can add a strategy, I can add a rate limiter, I can add a circuit breaker, I can add a concurrency limiter, or I can even add a timeout if I want. So I can say that, hey, this cannot take more than, I don't know, 30 seconds with the exponential back off. If it happens, then stop handling this. We want to fail earlier than that. And at the end, all we have to say is build and we have our pipeline. And now I can take this pipeline and I can put it here. I can say await the pipeline dot execute async. And then I'm going to take this one over here. This will give me a cancellation token. So we're going to call that CT. I can turn this into an async method. So I'm going to say async and then await in here and then return that and pass down the cancellation token. And that's it. All I'm doing is I'm wrapping with this pipeline. I'm executing this method through that pipeline. And if I went ahead and I just run this API, as you're going to see, everything will still work fine. But if I do have an exception, then it's going to be caught by this pipeline and it's going to be dealt with. We're going to have a retry and then we're also going to have a timeout. Now, the thing about this pipeline building aspect is that it is very expensive on a memory and a CPU level. You don't want to be building that pipeline every single time. Instead, what you want to do is you want to store it. So I'm going to cut it and I'm going to go to the very top and I'm going to say private, static, read only, because those are just the instructions on how to deal with it. And then I'm going to say resilience pipeline is called a pipeline. I'm going to take that over here and then I'm just going to use it. And now it's only going to be initialized once for the lifetime of the application. Those are the instructions I want. And then I can go ahead and use it in 
any method and I can reuse that single allocated object. And that will be enough, that will be just fine. But you can actually manage your retry policies and your resilience policies way easier with dependency injection because that package also adds dependency injection functionality. What do I mean by that? Well, I'm going to go ahead and just cut this from here. I'm just going to copy maybe these over here, the instructions, the retry and the timeout. The rest I'm going to just delete. And I'm going to go to the program.cs in the services. I'm going to say builder.services.add resilience pipeline. Now I'm going to have to name that pipeline and the name I want to use in this case is going to be just a string. I'm going to say default. This is my default resilience pipeline and I'm going to just use the builder. So I'm going to say uh, builder. Actually, I'm just going to say X because builder is used already. Uh, and then I'm going to say X dot and I'm going to add my policies, the retry and the timeout. And that is it. I just transferred what I had in here and now I can inject a resilience pipeline by name. It's not quite injecting. You actually inject, as you can see over here, private read only resilience pipeline provider. So where is it? Here we go. And then the generic type parameter is the key. The key in this case, it's a string. We identify it based on the name default. So I'm going to say pipeline provider, and then I'm going to inject that from the constructor. Here we go. So this is something injectable now. And then down here, what I'm going to say is pipeline equals pipeline provider dot get pipeline. And I'm going to get it by name. It is the default. Then take that, put it here and this will work. I'm going to just slap a breakpoint over here, run my API and just debug it to show you how it works. Here we go. API is running. So I'm going to go here and I'm going to say, yeah, get the weather for Warsaw, make this smaller. I'm going to get the resilience pipeline with all my configuration. If I expand it, I should be able to see two strategies. I have a retry and I have a timeout strategy Then I'm calling the weather API. And as you can see, we get the response back and we have it in Insomnia. And that's a way easier way to deal with the situation because now you have your retry policies in one place. And that's it. It's extremely easy now to add resilience into your application. This does not only work for HTTP requests. This will also work for any other type. You can just wrap anything and add resilience to it. This is not limited to HTTP. I want to be very aware of that. And actually, there's a brand new extension method as well, which you might have seen in .NET Aspire because it's used there by default. And it's the add standard resilience handler. And that allows me to decorate an HTTP client automatically with a single line of code with what Microsoft thinks the default should be. Now, how do I do that? Well, I do have to change my code here a bit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just copy this all and I'm going to uh, comment it out because if you want to grab the code and it's going to be for free in the description down below. So I'm going to duplicate everything and I'm going to change this a bit. I'm not going to inject an HTTP client factory and generate a client. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to inject an HTTP client. So private read only HTTP client over here and then inject it. And I'm going to just remove this, get the client and simply use it over here. That's it. Same code. I do have to change something in the add HTTP client method. I have to say that this is for the weather service. So anything I configure on this client now is for that weather service. And all I have to do to add the default resilience handler is add standard resilience handler. And that is it. And that will do all the instrumentation and all the wrapping behind the scenes. So I actually don't need to have the pipeline over here anymore. I can just delete that and that and that and that and I can just remove this all the way out and say that the weather response is that and just by doing that now our HTTP client is instrumented will have that retry policy and what are the defaults in this standard resilience handler well it gets a bit confusing but if we go in here you can see we add the standard resilience handler which is what's going to be used behind the scenes and that adds as we're going to see over here a rate limiter we have a timeout we have a retry policy, we have a circuit breaker, we have another timeout, and then that is it. We can actually see what the JSON structure of this policy looks like over here. So rate limiter with these options, then total request timeout, we have the retry policy, we have the circuit breaker, and then we have the attempt timeout. That's exactly what's in the defaults. Again, if you want to grab the code, it's going to be in the description down below. And I want to know from you, how are you dealing with policies like that? Were you using just 
Polly or did you hand roll your own? Leave a comment down below and let me know. Well, that's all I had for you for this video. Thank you very much for watching and as always, keep coding.